Hello, my dear students, and welcome back to chapter number two with our electronics one more. In the previous chapter, we have dealt with what's called the operational amplifier or, or op amps, where we have investigated different circuits, either based on resistance or even based on resistance and capacitor, in order to formulate different applications using operational amplifiers. Now, let's turn a new leaf. And let's start a new chapter dealing with what's called an electrical block. As I previously mentioned, this PN junction electrical block have been already tackled in our semiconductor solid state module in year one semester. However, what we are going to do in this chapter is to have a circuit perspective, a circuit point of view for the PN junction block. Maybe you can divide the lecture into two parts. The first part is somehow a revision part, where we will try to flash back what we already have learned in the solid state in order to reach the IV characteristic curve for a PN junction. It will be a very quick part as this data you have already uh, studied before. So I believe that you have the sufficient background. Then we will turn to our core chapter, dealing with the circuit model of the electrical lock. And finally, we will terminate the chapter by different application, like what we did for operational amplifier, different application where we can use dives in. So now, please let me start sharing my presentation slots and start our chapter number two under the title, Semiconductor PN Junction Dives. So let's start. Okay, let's start now our uh, lecture on the type of semiconductor junction and let's see what we're going to do. Okay, perfect. So again, this first part in the lecture is somehow a vision part dealing with the basics that we need from our solid state electronic tools. So first, if you remember, we define any semiconductor material in a form of an energy band diagram as what's called a valency band, a conduction band, and in between we have what's called the Fermi, uh, sorry, the energy band gap. The valency band, uh, and also we have what's called the Fermi level, which, as we know, the indicator to indicate the number of electrons to the number of and generally, for an, an, an intrinsic semiconductor, the Fermi level is center. I will highlight this later. So, generally, electrons occupy the valency band. Whenever there is no internal or external forces to make the electron to jump to the conduction. However, at room temperature and due to thermal energy, some electron can move from the valency band to the conduction band. So this electron, which move from the valency band to the conduction band, it first, first it's broke a bond in the valency band, most probably it's a covalent one, and it becomes partially free electron when it uh, reaches the conduction band. So this is a free electron. And what we have created here, which is a broken bond, is called pool. So by this motion, we have one free electron created in the conduction band, and one free fold in the valency band. Okay, how we can calculate the number of electrons in the conduction band or the number of folds in the valency band? The answer was very easy. What you are, what you are searching for actually two information. The first information is how many seats, how many states are available here? If you remember my dear student, the example of the students in the classroom, when I told you, please guess how many students are now in room, for example, 211. So the first information you, you are seeking for is how many seats is in the room. So for example, if I told you that I have 50 seats, then you know that the range is from zero to 50. But in order to complete your guess, you need another information, which is the probability. If you remember, again, my example one semester ago, I told you, if I told you 
what is the probability to find students in room 311 in building A when it's Friday 9 a.m. morning? Then the answer is typically zero. This is not because you don't have seats. You still have 50 seats. However, the problem is that the probability of students on Friday, which is a vacation, or it's a holiday, so this is zero. So you multiply 50 by zero, and then the output is zero. So what you are searching for is the number of seats and the probability to find electron. This is typically happen when we have these two functions. The, uh, so it's a, the, so it's a density of states function and the Fermi Dirac distribution. So for electrons, we say that we multiply the, 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 the density of state states in the conduction band. Again, this multiplication is limited to the conduction band because free electrons are only defined in the conduction band multiplied by f of e, which is a probability to find an electron. Similarly speaking, whenever you are talking about holes, you say that we multiply this density of states for holes. Again, this is defined only in the valency band multiplied by the probability to find an electron. Sorry, the probability to find a hole, which is one minus the probability to find an electron. So this is the electron. Uh, so this is a hole in the uh, valency. So perfect. Generally speaking, whenever the material is intrinsic, it is expected that the number of electrons in the conduction band equals to the number of holes in the valency band. And we call this what we call the intrinsic concentration, or NR. And this is a material parameter depending on the energy gap, the temperature, and the, the effective mass of the material. So generally, a node equals to P node equals to an I, which is actually makes sense because when we have this example, this first example, we say that whenever there's a created electron in the conduction band, there is correspondingly a created hole in the valence band. So it makes sense that the number of electrons equals to the number of holes. Okay, so that's perfect. Let's do it. Let's go more. And this is the relation. And from this relation, we have concluded the mass action law, which is very, very important in our study whenever the material or the device is under thermodynamic equilibrium, which states that M node times P node equals to NI squared. So this node by the student refer to what's called thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so. This is a problem. Now, what about the Fermi level? Let me again describe the concept of the Fermi level. The Fermi level, as I mentioned before, is an indicator which indicates that is a ratio between electrons and holes. So, whenever we have an intrinsic semiconductor material, I mean the number of electrons equals to the number of holes, then your indicator is typically in the middle. And this is the case for the Fermi level. Of course, we have a more detailed mathematical description in. The solid state course, but let's uh, keep only the conceptual one in this course just to indicate that the Fermi level is the indication with the ratio between electrons and holes. Now, how we can increase the number of electrons or how we can increase the number of holes, which is what we call the doping effect. So, in the previous slides, we were talking about what's called the intrinsic semiconductor. I mean, a pure material, a pure semiconductor material without any impurities, without any additives. It's a pure semiconductor, a pure silicon, for example. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to add a foreign material. We are going to add a new and adaptive or what we call an impurity material. Let's see how we will do this and what is, what is its effect. Um, so this is generally a semiconductor. Let's say that this is silicon, for example. So for each atom in silicon, it has four electrons in the outermost energy level, in the valency level. And these four electrons combine with another four electrons in a form of a covalent bond. That's why the silicon atom have four direct neighbors, as you can see. One, two, three, and four. These four direct neighbors sharing each with one electron. That's why we have what's called the covalent bond. What I'm going to do, my dear student, is that I will use a very high force, a very high external force from the outside to kick out one of these silicon atoms outside the material. And I will replace it with another, another atom. But this new atom is not belongs to silicon. It belongs to an impurity material. 
For example, what I'm going to do now is that I will kick out the silicon atom and replace it by another atom with five electrons in the, most, in the outermost energy level, what we call a fifth group material. So whenever you replace a silicon atom with a fifth group material atom, then these fifth groups by default have five electrons. Accordingly, four of the, out of these five electrons will combine with the four neighbors in the form of a covalent bond, typically like the typical, the, the original case, the standard case. And you will have one added, one more electron, which doesn't have a, a bond, which doesn't have a dark neighbor. So this added electron, the one with the red circle, is considered as a without bond electron, or what we can say, it's a partially free electron because the bond in chemistry represents an attraction force. So with it, whenever you don't have a bond, you don't have an attraction force, then you are free to move. Now, this electron can move easily to the valence, to the conduction band, but the important point is, my dear student, that whenever this electron moves to the conduction band, it will not create a cross-bonding hole. Because if you remember, my dear student, Whole are defined as the, uh, the definition of a broken bond inside the valency band. But this red electron doesn't make any bonds. So whenever this electron leaves the material, or I mean leaves the valency band to the conduction band, it will not make or it will not create any hole. That's why in this case, whenever you add a fifth group material to your semiconductor material, the number of electrons in the conduction band will increase without increasing the number of holes. So this is some sort of unbalance. Again, it's what we did in the intrinsic course. In the intrinsic case, whenever you have an electron, you have a corresponding hole. That's why the number of electrons equal to the number of holes. But in the extrinsic case, mainly in the fifth group case, whenever you add a fifth group material, then the number of electrons increase without increasing the number of holes. And if you remember, my dear students, I believe you remember that in this case, we say that N, which is the number of electrons, is roughly equals to ND, which is the number of donor atoms you add, and P, according to the mass action law, is equal to N squared over N. And herein, we have what's called an N type material, because the number of electrons is greater than the number of holes. Okay, accordingly, as far as the fluorine level is an indicator for the number of electrons and number of holes, please expect that the Fermi level will move upward to the conduction bed or to be closer to the conduction bed compared to the valence band. That's because simply the number of electrons is, uh, is greater than the number of holes. So the other rate, this is the, the overall uh, graphical solution. Again, you have this, the same number of seats. This is very important because the number of seats are constant. However, what it changes is the probability. So you have a different probability for electrons and holes. This is simply because the formula level is shifted up. That's why you have more electrons and less holes, as you can see. Okay, so this now this is the second uh, alternative or probability here. You know, uh, you, here again, you will kick out one of the silicon atoms, but what you will going to insert is not a, uh, a, a, a fifth group material. It will be a third group material. I mean, it has only three electrons in the outermost energy. Accordingly, these three electrons will combine directly with three neighbors of the silicon. And there will be one neighbor without an electron or one neighbor without a broken bond. Herein, you increase the number of broken bonds or between quotations, you increase the number of holes without increasing the number of electrons. That's why you have more holes and less electrons, and the material turns to be a P-type material. So in this case, please expect that the Fermi level will go downward toward to be more close to the valency band with respect to the conduction band, because this is an indication that you have more holes and the material is a P-type. Again, this is a perfect graphical solution. The number of seats keep kept the same. However, the number of the probability changes 
to indicate more cold and less thick. This is a briefing to what we have done. We have three cases for semiconductor material. The extreme left case indicates uh, intr an intrinsic case with number of electrons equals the number of holes and the Fermi level typically in the metal. The, the metal case indicates an n-type material. As you can see, the Fermi level shifted upward toward the conduction band, more electrons and less holes. And finally, the extreme right case indicates p-type material with a Fermi level shifted downward and more holes and less electrons. This is briefly what uh, we have said. Okay, now what we are searching for, or maybe you can ask you a question, why we are revising all this stuff? Actually, our device today is what's called a PN junction lock. So we are going to combine a B-type material with an N-type material. And herein, it makes sense first to refresh what is P-type and what's N-type. Now, we are going to combine these together to form what's called a PN junction. Now let's see together how we should combine the energy band diagram for a PN junction. Again, all this stuff is still under the title of a revision for the solid state module. We just need to refresh this knowledge in order to uh, be on track in our circuit's perspective for the dots. So let's start to think together now how we should plot an energy band diagram to combine a p-type material with an n-type material in the form of a p-n junction. And herein, I have to recall one of the most important information we have learned in our solid state electronics course, which is the thermodynamic equilibrium condition. And what is the sign for a thermodynamic equilibrium condition in an energy band diagram? So now let me return to my white paper and let's start together the description of this process. Okay, so first of all, let's start to plot each energy band diagram independently. So we have a p-type material. That's why we have here, this is EC and this is EV. And as far as the material is a p-type, so the Fermi level is more toward that to the veins band. Then we have on the other side an anti material. So we have EC and EV, and we have here our formula. Perfect. So now what we are seeking for, my dear students, is to combine these two energy band again to plot a combined energy band diagram for a PN junction. But if you remember my dear students, we have mentioned that whenever your device or material is under thermodynamic equilibrium, then you should have a horizontally aligned Fermi level across your device. If you remember in your in-class test and in your final exam one semester ago, I told you that whenever you have a Fermi and an energy band diagram, and I told you, please indicate either this material is under thermodynamic equilibrium or not. Please go directly to the Fermi level and see if it's horizontal or not. If the Fermi level is a horizontally aligned Fermi level, then this, this device is under thermodynamic equilibrium. So the sign for a thermodynamic equilibrium is a horizontally aligned Fermi level. Accordingly, your first step should be to blot a constant Fermi level. We are going to do this whenever we have any electronic semiconductor devices. It's a constant concept for thermodynamic equilibrium. Then what you're going to do is to plot everything with respect to this here. So for the P-side material, you have EV more close to the Fermi level and EC more far while in the right-hand side, you have the vice versa. You have here the EC, and you have downward the EV. Yeah. 
this is typically, I'm sorry, I have to make it like this. Okay, this is typically what you want. So this is the energy band diagram for a PN junction. And let's now start to discuss this energy band diagram in more detail because this is the clue. This is the, the key where we can understand the ID curve for energy band diagram, which is our target, by the way. So, Let me just plot it again. We have a Fermi level. Here, this is EV and this is EC. So this is EV, EC, EV, and EC. This is what we have in our uh, structure. So, whenever you are going to study this structure, you can divide it from my perspective into three parts. Okay, why did so? Because in the first or the most extreme left part, this is typically a P-type material. We have a horizontal EC, EV, and EF. We have a, a EF more close to the EC, so this is a, 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 a P-type material, as we already studied. Similarly, when we go to the extreme right, right case, this is typically an N-type material. But what is in between? The, interest, the interesting thing in this in-between region is that we have a tilted energy band again. And if you remember well from your solid state electronic course, a tilting means that you have an electrical field, you have a potential. This is typically because if there is an electron here, this electron will drift. This is the sign. And if you have a hole here, this hole will drift to this side. So you have a potential, you have an electrical field. But this is actually, again, is a concept of the plot because when we start the plot, we say that this is under thermodynamic equilibrium with a constant of Fermi level. So that's mean you don't have any external voltage applied because this is a horizontal Fermi level. Actually, this is the answer. We don't have any external voltage, but we have an internal voltage. That's why we call it as the internal potential of the P energy, or what is usually symbol by V node. So this V node is an internal dead potential. It's not an external one. And my evidence is that this Fermi level is horizontal, as it is. The tilting is in EC and EV, not in EF. So the applied voltage is not an external voltage, it's an internal one. Now, what happened for this applied voltage? Is it, is this applied voltage will cause current to move? Let's see. First of all, I told you that whenever we have an electron here, this electron will move to this direction. And whenever we have a hole here, this hole will move to this direction. That's to correct. So from this sign, you should say that we have current. We have electron moving, moving, and we have a whole movement. So this means that we have an electrical current because current, if you remember, I equals dq by dt. It's a, it's a moving charge. Whenever you have a moving charge, you have an electrical current. And now we have a moving charge. So do we have a current? Or the question is, could we have a current without having like an external voltage? This is just a PN junction. So can we have an electrical current in a PN junction without having a voltage? Let's see the answer. Okay, first we have to agree that we have electrons which are moving from here to there and holes which are moving from here to there, that's correct. However, there's two important points you have to take care of while you are studying this. First, this electron is coming from the left side, okay? So 
the left side has a majority of holes and a minority of electrons. And this hole is coming from the right side where we have a majority of electrons and a minority of holes. So this plotted electron and this plotted hole represent what we can call a minority carrier because this electron is coming from the P side and this hole is coming from the N side. Okay, so as far as they are minority, then they are low, uh, low number, not a very high number. So we can say that we have a current, but this current is a very limited current. That's it. If you remember from our solid state coach, we have mentioned that we have two types of current. What we call the drift current, which is due to the tilting in the energy in, in the energy diagram, as you can see. And what we call a diffusion current. If you remember the concept of the diffusion, let me Describe it in another page, just as a reference. If you remember the concept of the diffusion, which was introduced when I gave you the example of whenever you, you prepare a hot cup of tea. So I told you that you have your cup and you have water. And then you drop the tea packet. What is ha what happened? This tea packet contains a very high concentration of tea. However, the surrounding medium, which is water, includes no tea. So a diffusion starts to happen from the higher concentration region to the lower concentration region. Now, these tea particles start to penetrate and diffuse inside the water. And you can feel this by the calorie change in the water from a transparent to a uh, reddish or reddish brown. This is a diffusion. Another example of a diffusion, whenever you have two water tanks and there is here a valve, this is the level of the water here and this is the level of the water there. Whenever you open this valve, water will start to diffuse from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. So the concept of diffusion is simply related to the propagation from the higher concentration to the lower concentration region. So how we can reflect this diffusion to our case? How we can reflect this diffusion to our case? Let's see. Here we have electrons due to drift, but as I mentioned here, here we have holes, uh, majority, and electrons minority. While here we have electron as a majority and holes as a minority. So whenever you will create this junction, electron will see a variation in concentration. In this region, you have too many electrons, majority, while in this region, a very limited number of electrons. So electrons will start to diffuse from the higher concentration region to the lower concentration region. Please check the direction of the arrow. Here you have a drift current from left to right while here you have a diffusion current from right to left. So these two currents will cancel each other. Similarly, for the holes, you have here a hole current, drift hole current from right to left, but you have also a diffusion current from left to right. So the overall current is equal to zero. That's why at the thermodynamic equilibrium for a VN junction, the overall current is equal to zero. And actually, this is totally makes sense as far as you have a device without any external voltage. Logically, you will not be able to do that. Current. Otherwise, whenever you buy a die and you start to hold this die, you will feel the electrical current. 
mucus is losing touch, which is of course abnormal. So this is makes sense that the overall current flow in nervous structure is equals to zero. This is typically because the first current cancels the closing process. But let's ask, let, let's start ask another question, which is if you would like to conduct an electrical current in this device, what you should do? Or electrical current is a rate of a change of motion of carriers, which is actually the law. So which carriers you should target in order to have an electrical current? It makes sense to say that the, the, the carriers you should target is the high majority carriers. Because I proportional is Q. Whenever you have more Q, you will have more I. If you push the minority carry, you will create current, but this current will be very, very limited. But if you would like to increase the current, then you should think about a charge or Q, which is large. Here I'm talking about the majority carry. Okay, perfect. So what we are seeking for is to push the majority carriers to move so that we can create an electrical current. Let's see how we can push this majority carriers to move. Okay, perfect. Again, let's start with Let's start with the thermodynamic equilibrium energy band diagram. So this is the Fermi level. And we have something new present. This is E Fermi. And then we have this E V, sorry, and this is this. And this is our formula. Now, where is our majority carriers? Okay, so let's make the same uh, um, classification. In this region, we have electrons as a majority carrier. And in this region, we have holes as a majority carrier. Okay, so now the question is, does this electron capable to move? The answer will be simply no, because in order to make this electron move, you have to pass this barrier. Please remember that the energy for electrons increases by going upward. So this state, let's call it state number two, and let's call this state number one. So this state of state number two has higher potential with respect to state number one. So in order to go from state number one to state number two, you have to pass this barrier, which is, please remember, this barrier is due to the building potential, which is we know. So this building potential acts to prevent the majority carrier from moving from right to left. On the other hand, similar same happen for holes. Please remember that the holes energy increase downward. So here we have state number two, and here we have state number one. And now you can say that the potential energy of state number one is greater than the potential energy of state number two. So Holes will not be able to move from this side to this side. Accordingly, accordingly, you don't have electrons, or electrons will, are not are not moving, and holes are not moving. Why? Due to this building potential. So, in order to make your electrons mo move, you should add a potential against this V. so that they can push electrons. It's very simple, but my, my dear students, 
the, you need electrons to move from right to left. And you need holes to move from left to right. Electrons are negative charge. So I will connect my my die here by a positive term. And the holes are a negative charge. Uh, sorry, holes are a positive charge. So I will connect my device here by a negative term. So now there is a negative voltage here. So holes will be attracted. And now there is a positive voltage here. So electrons will be attracted. And in order to pass this barrier, your voltage should be greater than V0, what, what we call the V forward. So if you add a V forward, which is in this polarity, I mean the P side is connected to the positive and the N side is connected to the negative, and the value is V forward greater than V0, then you will push electrons and the holes to move. And then you will have an electric current. And this is what we call the forward bias condition. Okay, what happens if? What happens if the same Fermi level and you add another battery, but now you reverse the polarity? So the voltage now is in the same polarity of V0. So what will happen is that you are going to increase the barrier. So no majority carrier will move, but some of the minority carriers here and the minority carriers here will be able to move. So you will have an electric current, yes. But again, this will be a very small and limited electric current because this is due to minority carriers. So now let me return back to my presentation slides. As you can see here, we have the Fermi levels and we have n-type and p-type. We combine them together. So we have this structure, which is a p-n junction. And we have stated that and the thermodynamic equilibrium that the overall p-n junction is equals to zero. The overall current, I mean, is equal to zero because the drift current will cancel the diffusion curve. Now, and this is a building potential, by the way, this equation, we don't need to, to remember these equations. It's already a part of a previous uh, course. Now, now we have another three cases. So this is a normal case where we have no voltage connected to the PN junction. So we have a potential called V node, which will prevent majority carriers from moving from uh, the N side to the P side for the electrons and from the P side to the N side for holes. If you add a forward voltage, then the barrier will start to reduce till the forward voltage is greater than V node, then electrons will move. If you add a reverse voltage, then the barrier will increase and the current will be only due to minority carriers. Generally, this is the output of my system. And let's focus directly on this output. Please don't focus on mathematics. I will not ask you about this, any mathematical derivations. So you, you, are, you are not obligated to follow these mathematics. You can only do it for your interest if you want to, but you have to understand well this work. I can divide this curve, my dear students, into very important four portions. And a fifth will be added one slide more. But let's start with the fifth. First, the thermodynamic equilibrium. What is the thermodynamic equilibrium? That there is no voltage applied to the device. So this is the origin point. So when I told you where the thermodynamic equilibrium point in the IV curve, this is simply the origin. Whenever the voltage is zero, the current is zero. Then the next point is when you apply the forward voltage, the voltage is forward, which is the first criteria. Then here we have two conditions. If the forward voltage is smaller than V node, then you will, you will still have a limited current because you still have a barrier, which, sorry, which is this portion, as you can see. Once the voltage, once the voltage is greater than V, v, v node, which is the building potential, then you have a very 
exponentially increasing point, as you can see. Because simply, you attract, you are now pushing the majority carriers. So we are pushing very huge amount of, of carriers. So now we have the thermodynamic equilibrium, which is the origin. We have the, the stage where V is smaller than V node. We call it the uh, sub building voltage. I mean, the voltage inserted is below the building. So you have a very limited current. Then whenever the V is greater than V node, you will start to have a very huge exponential current. When the current, when the voltage is uh, reverse, then you will have current, very limited current, only due to the minority carrier. That's why the current here is very low. And we call this the reverse bias. So we have the forward bias whenever the V is greater than V node. And we have the reverse of the bias where the move movement of the current is due to the minority carrier. The most important equation, my dear student, is this equation, which expresses the, the, the motion of the current in the forward region, saying that I, which is a current, equals to I node, which we call the saturation current, E powers or exponential QV over KT minus one. V is the voltage, Q is the charge constant, 1.6 times 10 power negative 19, K is Boltzmann constant, T is temperature. So as you can see from this equation that the current is directly proportional to the exponential of the voltage. That's why we have a very high increasing current while increasing the voltage. And as a fifth portion, we have what's called the breakdown voltage. Maybe we will talk about it in the end of this, uh, of this lecture in what's called the Zener breakdown. However, simply speaking, this breakdown is the region at which whenever you increase the reverse voltage to a limit so that the current starts to increase signif significantly and you have what's called a breakdown, a failure to the device. So it's a high reverse bias voltage, which make the current increase very rapidly, as you can see here. Maybe we will talk more about reverse uh, breakdown in the portion of the Zinner dial, which, is, which will be the final portion of this lecture. So this is the termination of part number one. The main important output of part number one, my dear student, is to understand this IV curve and this, the region of operation for the IV curve, that we have Four, five region of operation. We have the thermodynamic equilibrium point. We have the voltage forward, but still less than V node. So the current is very limited. Whenever the voltage is greater than V node, the current starts to increase rapidly. The reverse voltage is very limited because this is due to minority carrier. And finally, this breakdown voltage. These are the main five parts for an uh, IV curve for the operation, for the P engine conductor. In the next part, we are going to leave the solid state electronics. We are going to leave the semiconductors. And we are going to try to represent this device as a circuit element. Whenever you have a dime, how this dime will work as a circuit element. This will be our challenge in the next part of this lecture. Chapter number two, dealing with the uh, electrical uh, uh, semiconductor junctions or the PN junctions. Thank you very much for your concentration and see you in the next chapter, in the next part, part number two of chapter number two. Thank you very much.